And uh, the game being news and the change washing over it is social media. I'm Don Genova. I'm the president of CMG Freelance, which means I can do this sitting in my living room right now. This uh, workshop was organized by us. We represent freelance contributors and contractors at the CBC and via our independent membership and by CWA Canada Associate Members, which is a free union membership for students, volunteers, and precarious media workers. As a member of either organization, you'll have access to a recording of this webinar. As a freelance member, you can access the recordings through logging on to cmgfreelance.ca and you'll see a drop down menu for webinars and as an associate member you can access the recordings through the link in your e-newsletter if you have questions during the presentation you can type them in the chat box below the presentation and if you want you can also increase the size of the presentation by clicking in the top right corner of the powerpoint window we are very fortunate to have ilamine abdel mahmoud online with us today he is the social media editor for buzzfeed canada and uh, you'll soon be able to tell he's interested in messing around with this weird role that social media is starting to play in telling news and stories. Now, before BuzzFeed, he handled social media for TVO's current affairs and documentaries. He also worked on The Agenda with Steve Pakin and CBC's The National. He tells us he will only reply to your tweets if you make a Beyonce reference, but you can follow him at Elaman88. And I'm going to bring him online now. And through the magic of television, we're sitting 3,000, 5,000 kilometers across the country. And there he is now. And I will let you take it away. Go right ahead. Can you focus? Can everybody hear me okay? Amazing. Uh, I'm going to hang up on this phone now. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome everyone to, uh, to this talk. I'm really excited to uh, be talking about this. This is my favorite topic of all. Um, and uh, right before I get into this conversation, um, I just sort of want to talk to you a little bit, what, a little bit about what I do. Um, so I'm the social media editor for BuzzFeed Canada. Um, that means I'm responsible for the news um, or they be um, some, what we call buzz, which is just some of the lighter stuff that we do. And uh, that also means I'm responsible for crafting the brand. Um, and for us, a place like BuzzFeed, uh, the brand uh, and is, is largely social news. And the stuff that we talk about when we mean social news is actually like everything that people are talking about, everything that people are interested in talking about. If you can just give me one second. Um, Don, I've become a participant again, and I, I need to be a presenter one more time in the settings so I can switch my slide here. I don't know if that was heard or not. Perfect. Here we go. Um, so let me first talk to you about BuzzFeed and the work that we do. Um, what is the best example of the work that we do? I think I use this image a lot for questions and uh, that I like to pose to you and I think when I'm trying to describe what BuzzFeed does ideally I think to this um, that's the dress that's the most famous BuzzFeed post it is still sits at the number two position of the most viewed BuzzFeed post of all time um, it's been a year and it's some at something like 40 million views but the dress didn't start off as a dress and it didn't start off organically as something so so magnificent um, for us. It started off as a very small argument on Tumblr um, that everyone was really disagreeing about the colors of this dress. By the way, how many of you think it's white and gold? How many of you think it's black and blue? I'm just interested in, in the feelings that people still have about the dress. It's been about a year or so, you know? Um, so feel free to post that in the chat box because I'm too, totally still interested in how people feel about this. Um, me, I still refuse to give up on the dream that it's white and gold. Um, but the dress is silly, but the dress was also noticed by someone at BuzzFeed um, who occupies a position, Tumblr editor. That's not a job that a lot of newsrooms have, um, but BuzzFeed does. We value Tumblr as a space and we say, you know, like we're going to have somebody dedicated specifically to mining Tumblr um, for interesting conversations because the, one of the core beliefs of BuzzFeed is that if people are talking about it, then it's worth sort of 
you know, discussing. Um, and so what are we going to be talking about in terms of what the game changes? You know, I want to talk to you a little bit about this image. Um, these days were simpler days, simpler times. Ten years ago, uh, Zac Efron, the first high school musical, um, it was a year, the year was 2006 and nothing was as complicated as it is now. Uh, now we're in 2016 and everything is, uh, is a little bit messy. So what are we going to be talking about? I don't know. Let me tell you. Um, we're talking about how Facebook is eating the media. So this is a great headline that came from, from Slate in January of 2015. Uh, it's one of my favorite headlines. It's very, it's very Slate-like. You know, it's very dramatic, very high stakes. But what this piece is really about um, is a new change that Facebook introduced, which is autoplay videos on your timeline. So starting in uh, last January, Facebook started playing videos automatically in your timeline as soon as you logged on to Facebook. Um, sounds like a small change, but what, what actually in, in effect it meant was Facebook was making a direct play for all video content that you have. So instead of posting it on YouTube, if you post it directly to Facebook, Facebook said, look, we'll make sure that five times as many people see it um, as they do if you just post a YouTube link. So this was like a really big play um, for, to have people start publishing stuff directly onto Facebook. Um, fast forward another month, this is a, excuse me, this, is a, this headline is from, from the Atlantic, uh, and uh, the better politeness of headline, um, big fan of it, but what this piece really is about um, is this, this one Atlantic editor uh, who noticed that he crafted the perfect tweet. So this one tweet, was like 10,000 times. And he was really curious about the kinds of views that drove to the Atlantic's website um, and what that meant for it. Because to him, he was like, whoa, this tweet got so much in terms of traffic on Twitter. What does that really mean? And he sort of found out that it didn't actually drive as much traffic to, uh, to the website, to the Atlantic website. Uh, really what had happened was everyone looked at this tweet and he told every single piece of information that people needed to know. So they didn't need to actually click through to go to the website. So this was a, this was a pretty big, interesting change. And then this dovetails nicely um, with a couple of months later, um, Snapchat launched what they call Discover. Um, if you're not, you're not really familiar with Snapchat Discover, what, what it really is, um, is publishers, BuzzFeed included, but many organizations have the capacity to publish your content directly onto Snapchat. Um, so, you know, you can discuss stuff, you can snap your friends, but you can also view some news or entertainment content directly on your, on, directly on your Snapchat phone app, sorry. Um, so all of these changes sort of add up together to this really interesting moment, um, which is Facebook launched something called Instant Articles. If you haven't seen Instant Articles, you probably have, you just don't know that you've seen them. And there are those uh, little, um, like Facebook articles that you see with a little thunderbolt in the top right corner um, on your mobile app. And what those mean is really that that article lives entirely within the Facebook landscape. Uh, users are not leaving the platform in order to go read that article. They're reading it entirely on Facebook. For the longest time, you know, like how you drove traffic to your website is like you post a link. And then once you post that particular link, um, people go to your website. Uh, but Facebook is saying, look, we don't want people to leave this website because it's better for us if they stay. So why don't you just publish this stuff directly onto Facebook? Uh, and it started with a few publishers and then eventually kind of snowballed. And now most publishers have the capacity to publish instant articles. I know we do it probably like 60% of the time. Um, so what do all these changes mean? I mean, this is a pretty typical day, I think, of last year. That, those numbers have changed a bit, but the ratios have kind of held up. Um, but those numbers are pretty typical of a, of a day at BuzzFeed Canada. So, you know, Facebook might drive 56,000 sessions. Um, in comparison, the number of people who type in the words buzzfeed.com are only 8,900 people. Uh, Twitter is way down to about 2,700 people. So it's not, you know, like those are not especially high numbers. Facebook is still the big player here. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to direct. Uh, originally, this presentation was titled no one cares about your website. And I sort of thought that was like a mean thing to say. So I, I changed it to what do you do when the game changes? But what I, what the, the thrust of the presentation is what we're dealing with is a sea change in where people consume this content. So for the longest time, uh, there was a, 
when search was driving most of the traffic on the web, it was, it was really important to get good SEO, right? It was really good. It was really important to rank well in Google so that all of the search results can lead back to your website. That's still important. As you can see, it's third on this particular list, but it's not first. Social has overtaken search by a lot in terms of being like the most important factor of what drives people to your content and where they consume it. But more so, social media organizations, platforms particularly, are really greedy about this. Um, they want they want you on their platforms, and they know that they're the best way for you to get eyeballs. So they're not really interested in having their people leave the platform. So they're they're interested in working with you and with us, um, with all journalists, to figure out ways for that content to be best created um, for the platform, so that people never have to use never have to actually leave it. And so, our, because of all of this, Facebook changed its algorithm a little bit last year to sort of start encouraging certain behaviors. So the mysterious algorithm has been changed. Video is top, right? If you're producing video, it's so good for Facebook. It's so good for your, for, for your page ranking. Um, Facebook essentially is saying, we'll make sure that people see it if you put up a video. Pictures are next. Pictures are actually higher than links. Uh, pictures, links, and then at the very bottom is text. Like if you're just posting a block of text, like Facebook will not be interested in serving that to a larger group of audience. For the most part, video is the thing that grabs uh, people's attention, and that's partly because Facebook makes sure of it. So uh, that's sort of the landscape that we're dealing with in this particular moment, is video, pictures, uh, what we at BuzzFeed call distributed content, which is to say it's distributed directly on the platform, um, and then links after, come after that. So to do a little bit of uh, examples of this, this is a, a Facebook post from election night last year. Um, Justin Trudeau will be Canada's 23rd Prime Minister. Um, this is a link post to an article that Paul McLeod had written about the updates from election night. Um, and this is the same, exact same article, just with a slightly different picture, but posted as a native picture. And then as a, just as a caption for it, we put the headline and then the link. No one clicked on that link. Um, but so many people shared that picture, shared it as a picture. So like people engaged with the content, but they didn't necessarily go to the actual website. So when comparing the two of them, I got much higher engagement on this piece of content because it's just a photo um, than this, which is a link that's asking people to leave the platform. By and large, these platforms are encouraging behavior that makes people not leave the platform. And you know what, we're also sort of learning that most people don't want to leave the platform anyway. Like mo I, Anecdotally, most people will not admit to this, but anecdotally, you, you kind of get a good impression that there are a lot of people whom, when you post a link, for example, and you post a little excerpt description of it, most people will, will read that and will share it based on that. If they do click through, they're not staying on those websites for very long. They're not staying for longer than two, three minutes. Um, they're by and large, it depends on the types of content, but for the most part, your average user is not really going to websites for especially a long time. Um, so we started creating content that specifically lives on the platform. This, uh, this is a good example of one. This is just a little joke. Um, as you can see, it, it was shared you know, 2,300 times, um, liked more than 3,000 times. Uh, it's a funny joke and it's very simple, which is, you know, like, look guys, I found an American quarter because the value of the, American, of the Canadian dollar at the time was so low. Um, so we just posted with you okay Canada and you know it did really well for us and I understand that you know jokes have an easier time doing very well this is also another little joke um, post but this is a screenshot of a tweet and it had a million people reached and 11,000 shares uh, it's really important to emphasize that this is when our page was like the size of a very small page. at the time we were something like 25,000 people nothing more than that uh, we were getting a million people reached and that's because largely the Facebook algorithm was encouraging the kind of behavior that keeps people um, directly, on, directly on the platform. So if your content is good and it doesn't take people out, out of the platform, it's going to be really encouraged. I want to talk about this interesting stat here. Uh, Joanna Peretti, the founder of BuzzFeed, I think gave the stat maybe last year at uh, South by Southwest. He said that as much as 75% of BuzzFeed's content is now published somewhere else. 
excuse me. So you have to imagine, you know, 1300 people showing up to work every day. Um, all of them creating all different types of content. And then 75% of that content does not actually go and live on Facebook, on, on buzzfeed.com, like the actual website. It's created for all of our other channels, right? So whether it's like just a photo for our Snapchat Discover channel, um, or just like a little infographic for our news Twitter account, uh, all different types of content that is distributed um, doesn't live on our website, or it can live on our website, but for the most part, it doesn't. It's published somewhere else, and it's created for somewhere else. Um, as as we sort of embrace this model, we've started seeing huge, huge number. Example of this: here's a it's a little again. It's a it's really easy to do this with jokes, uh, with, with joke posts, um, but that's a lot of the content that we traverse in. So this post is, here's a map of how Canadians see other Canadians. Um, I don't know if you can read that, but where it says, well, it's like Alberta says cowboys, you know, and then we get ice. But the, the, important, the important bit from this particular post here and this particular image is that it had 105 likes and 43 shares and a total of 24,000 people reached. Now let's compare that with posting that map just as an image. So not trying to drive people to the website where they can engage with this content, just serve it to them directly on the platform. Here we have 24,000 people. Here the distributed version has 2 million. Uh, so just to compare 24,000 to 2 million. Um, this one has 14,000 shares and 7,000 likes. Um, so again, this is 24,000 uh, people reached. This is 2 million people reached. It's, it's really, you know, like why would you even continue to create content for a website uh, if Facebook is continuing to encourage you to just, you know, make that content specifically um, for the platform because that's where it will do amazing. Uh, we've got tons of examples of this. So here's, here's a post that actually did pretty well. Um, the beep test, which is this test that these that high school students have to do, I think in a lot of provinces, but not, maybe not all of them. Um, it's like a, a running test, and so it's a it's a joke post about the beep test and how it's really difficult to survive. Seventy thousand people reached, pretty good. One hundred thirty-five shares, pretty good. Um, here's a here's just an image. Three million people reached. Uh, Thirteen thousand shares, and. Is that 37, 36,000 likes? So we go from, you know, really good, like this is not bad at all, 135 shares and 70,000 people reached to 3 million people reached and 13,000 shares. And the only thing that changed is that I just took one piece of content from this post. There were 17 tweets and I just took one of them and decided to experiment with it to see what would happen if I decided to do that as a distributed post. And well, it did magnitudes, magnitudes better. Um, we have the data for, for lots of examples. Twitter is a really good example of this. Um, so we took like on election night, people were, uh, Twitter really likes like really like funny, um, pithy jokes. And this was a good example of that. So it was a stressful night that night. Election results were coming in. The Blue Jays were, were playing and Hotline Bling video, Drake's video came out. And so we were, we had our attention divided. And so we sort of made a little joke out of this. And now it continues to be one of our top, um, top tweeted tweets of all top retweeted tweets of all time. Um, all because we didn't try to make that joke, you know, somewhere else, um, like on the website, we didn't bother sitting around being like, how can this work on the website? And we just, we just did it. Um, and we did it directly on the platform and that's what sort of made it work really well. This is a this is the video that we did, and it's so the, this is the simplest format of content the content conversion you can take. So I took a GIF, which is a Bugs Bunny severing um, the border between Canada and, uh, and the United States, and, I, and the caption on it was "What Canada plans to do if Trump is elected." It, it continues to be one of our top shared things of all time at thirty nine thousand shares and five five point six million people reached. Um, but all I did was I had the GIF open and I recorded my screen and that turned it into a video because I knew that the Facebook algorithm really rewards video. Um, so it really can be that simple. It's as simple as 
figuring out the best way to serve that content directly on the platform. And so part of what I do, um, both as a BuzzFeed uh, social media editor for Canada, and also I have a job with the news curation team, um, which is a part of my job is working with BuzzFeed News. Um, and with my entire job is to take content and figure out how best to serve it on the platform so it'll do well. Not, and the measurement of that isn't to have people click through. Like no one says this didn't get as many click throughs as I'd hoped. Um, really what they say is how did that tweet or how did that Facebook post perform? Because you really have to measure these things within the platform um, as opposed to what you're forcing people to do because we're really all the data and all the user behavior is suggesting that people don't want to leave the platforms. So we had a quote from Jonah Peretti. Here's a quote from me, because um, why not? Uh, the quote for me is, the old ways rely on creating content and publishing it on every platform. That's what we used to do. You know, you take a link, you post it on Twitter, you, take, you post it on Facebook, um, you post it on whatever other platform you have. The future really relies on speaking the unique tone and language of that platform and what it demands. Um, that's, a, that's a really important thing. Um, sorry. So in other words, um, all the rules of what we used to know as social media have really changed. Um, and the rules are in flux. No one knows where this is going. Like No one seems to know the answer, the magic solution to social media. What we do know is that users are not really interested in leaving the platform. Um, and there's a lot you can do with that once you know that. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Being able to adjust quickly is very key. Um, Facebook changes algorithm probably like once a month. Um, they always send out a, a big press release and be like, well, you know, we've changed this, this, and this. Now we're going to favor this over this, this over this. Um, those are things that are important to keep on top of and to change your operation as you're sort of, you know, finding out what those changes are. And then you keep a record of everything you try. Um, keep a record because it's really important to kind of have A-B testing and to go beyond just having a hunch to be like, I know this worked, this particular thing worked, um, and that's why we're trying it, that's why we're doing it. Or this thing didn't work, I know because I've tried it six or seven times, um, and, uh, and evolving with the things that don't work and stop, you just stop doing them. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some, this is one of my favorite tweets, but it's a very stupid tweet, and I want you to forgive how stupid it is. Um, and it's from Denny's. Um, so Denny's, you know, the, the breakfast place, sort of figured out, and they're perfect at it, um, sort of figured out how to play into the voice of Twitter. They're like, look, if we keep being like, go to Denny's all the time, people won't do it. But if we serve them content that looks like the content on the platform, they might engage with it. And they sort of nailed that. Like they have this ad agency that comes in every single day and they just like draft, you know, like 70 tweets about eggs or whatever every single day. Um, and then they tweet those out. And they, for that reason, they have one of my favorite Twitter presents. Um, this, is, this is a tweet. It is honestly the stupidest thing I've ever read in my life. But it makes me laugh every time I see it. And um, I think beyond that, um, it speaks, it's a kind of a part of why Denny's is so good um, at Twitter and so good at uh, Tumblr. Like they, they do this content all the time because they understand that on Twitter, you kind of have to be a little bit irreverent and no one wants to see your ads all the time. No one wants to hear about like, your brand voice all the time. What they want to hear about is you making jokes like them um, because that's what, that's what people do when they're existing on that particular platform. So look at this for a second longer, and then I'll move on. I lied, that was just a drink break for me. Okay, so I wanna talk about some of the organizations who have entirely shifted their operation based on all these changes that we're seeing um, to social media and how it's coming up. So I hope you guys have heard of Al Jazeera Plus. So Al Jazeera Plus, it's a wing of Al Jazeera that started testing out, you know, short form video on Facebook. Um, and lucky for them, that was right around the time that Facebook decided that they want to change um, to really encourage video. And so Al Jazeera Plus Now is an operation that does no writing whatsoever. Um, they only produce little videos that are usually 90 seconds to three minutes long um, that are about like a single issue or a single thing that happened that day. 
and they do amazing stuff. And all of this stuff is so widely seen. It's just incredible to me um, because they're sort of among the new superpowers. Like I, you know, people look to, to companies like BuzzFeed in terms of seeing like what's working well for them. Me as a person, like I look to these guys and, and try to figure out because like they're they're on my heels. They're, they're the kinds of people that I'm sort of trying to stay ahead of the whole time. Um, and then Al Jazeera Plus as an idea was a relatively small idea. They're mostly um, a Facebook operation. They, have, they do have presence on other platforms. Um, excuse me, then in comes along an organization called Now This News. And Now This News has entirely done away with their website. This is their homepage, um, or at least it was until very recently. I think they might have recently changed it. But, you know, when you go to their homepage, it says, uh, homepage, even the word sounds old. We bring, you the, we bring the news to your social feed. Um, now this literally does not host the content on its own website. Um, most of the content that it produces is entirely on their social channels. Um, so what that means is you will find them on Facebook, you will find them on Twitter, um, you will find them elsewhere, but you will not find, because they understand that people are not, um, or new audiences are not going to, uh, to websites. What they really want is to engage with that content directly on the platform. So this is, this is sort of the offering, you know? So like you can see on the, on the right-hand side of each picture here, like they have Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, um, Instagram, and Vine. And for Facebook, they have, you know, six different Vine verticals. Uh, six, for Facebook, they have six different Facebook verticals um, that are like, now this news, now this election, now this entertainment. Um, they recently launched now this weed and now this booze. Um, for weed, I think they're just keeping track of all the legal challenges that happen um, to, to uh, marijuana legalization in America. And they're producing really great content there. Um, now this future, very simple idea of just keeping track of technological um, stories that are really cool and like really visual and they do those there. But all they do, all they do um, is, is short, short videos that explain the thing that you, that, you know, explain the stories of the day or explain the big stories that people are talking about. Um, this is incredibly productive for them because their videos get, you know, millions and millions of views every single day. Um, I think if you go now to their Facebook pages, you'll see just the incredible amount of shares that they'll have on a video posted, you know, two or three hours ago. Um, so they, what they do, I think, is something to keep track of. And I think that's sort of where we're all heading. Um, not necessarily BuzzFeed, but I think just like the industry writ, writ large, um, this is the kind of stuff that we're, uh, we're thinking about. Um, let me just uh, find my next slide here. This is another joke, another little joke that I did because you can do that on Twitter. Um, again, not content that I'm looking to have people go to the website to consume, um, just content that I'm looking for people to just engage with me on the platform because it's better for us um, that our Twitter account is better known or our Facebook page is better known because then we'll have more people and then more people will see that content directly on that platform um, without having to necessarily, you know, force them to go uh, to the website. So I want to talk to you a little bit about a very interesting uh, that happened last year. Um, who can tell me what the logo on the left is? Feel free to type it in the little chat. If you know what it is. If you don't know what it is, totally no pressure. I will tell you in like two seconds. Anyone want to take a crack at it? Yeah, it's Meerkat. It's, it is a ferret. <laughs> It's not a bear. It's a meerkat. Um, and meerkat was an app that launched last year um, at South by Southwest. It's this amazing app. Super simple to use. It's just uh, supposed to be live, um, like live video broadcasting. And it changed the game of live video broadcasting for about two weeks. Um, and I literally mean two weeks because in two weeks after that, the logo on the right launch, which is Twitter's counter offer, um, it's called Periscope. Um, and it's just Periscope does the exact same thing. It just gives you the ability to broadcast live from a specific location. Um, totally incredible apps. And it, it seemed like for a little while, the platforms are totally invested in having people um, broadcast live. Fast forward a few months later, Facebook came out with something called Facebook Live because Facebook can do that. And Facebook can 
absolutely book, Bigfoot anybody in the game. Um, this is a Facebook Live video that I did where I tried what Australians call fairy bread. I'd never heard of it before. Um, it's literally sprinkles on bread. It was fine. Um, but really, the main point of showing you this is that Facebook is encouraging Facebook Live so much that this video of myself and my coworker Sarah Asler just having a go at fairy bread um, had 47,000 views, and I think at a certain point, 30,000 concurrent viewers. Um, that's pretty. Those are pretty incredible numbers, especially for just two random people just trying an Australian snack. Um, but it's not random in the sense that Facebook is really encouraging um, all businesses, um, all publishers to experiment more and more with Facebook Live. I know I work in an organization where we have an internal target of a number of minutes a week um, of doing, doing live. Um, and it's not, it's, not a small, it's not a small target. And we hit it a lot of, like, every, almost every week. Um, I, don't, I don't think I can talk about what that target is. It's like a lot of minutes. Um, but Facebook is encouraging a lot of publishers to do more and more, more and more of live. Um, so that seems to be like the next evolution of the game. That if you're, you know, if you're in this particular industry, you 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 are doing more and more Facebook lives because it just get, it's so much better for your for your page ranking to do that. Um, so again, we don't know where that's, that particular bit is going, um, but just to show you that, you know, in, in this particular industry, it really is sort of a game of like Facebook says jump, and we all turn around and be like, we don't want to jump, and then we have to answer and go how high. Um, and this is another tweet from Denny's because I love them so much. This is the stupidest tweets in the world. Um, yes, John, Facebook sort of killed off Meerkat. And Periscope killed off Meerkat as well. Like, those did not help um, because Meerkat for two weeks was like really the only property um, in this particular game. Um, and so people were flocking to it. They were seeing new signups by rates at rates that very few people have seen in terms of new apps. Um, and new apps really have like that first really shaky period um, to cement themselves and attract as many people as possible. Meerkat was doing so well by those standards. They, they, they were seeing incredible internal numbers until Twitter came along and said, well, we have an even bigger product, big, even bigger um, product, um, and you should use this. Um, and Twitter, of course, using all the power that it has sort of killed it. Um, and Meerkat, I think, hung around, it's probably still around like, with a few few people, it's still probably pretty popular. Um, but Facebook, with how easy Facebook Live is to use, um, has sort of eliminated competition. Like I don't I don't see journalists um, and media companies talking about like a Meerkat strategy, you know, like that's not a conversation that's happening. But Facebook Live, you betcha. Um, I think every organization at this point is having a conversation about that. Um, good question. How do I think Facebook Live will affect Snapchat, Instagram, video stories? You know, to me, I think they serve different markets, um, particularly because Facebook Live uh, is really good for established organizations and like a mass crowd of audience. Uh, Snapchat and Instagram, like, I mean, they're still babies in comparison to Facebook. Um, so they will continue to be niche markets. And I think like with people like me, I, I'm not... I'm going to be interested in watching a few clips on Snapchat, but I will, I have sat down to watch like full length interviews um, on Facebook Live. So they can just do much different things, um, particularly in terms of like long form, longer form video. And I think that's where Facebook Live kind of distinguishes itself because uh, Snapchat and, and Instagram were both not built for this. Like they were not originally intended for this. And I think that makes them always behind in this in this in this game um i don't have any other slides by the way like this is this is the end of it so we'll we'll, we'll end it there in terms of like the formal part of the conversation just like lob questions i think i got i got time let's do this if you have any questions that was a joke <laughs> Any other questions you guys have? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Dan. Um, 
there's sort of there's this sort of great mood in the industry that at a certain point all these platforms are going to have to turn around and say look we're we will we're willing to revenue share right um i think that's a bet that organizations like now this news are banking on um if you base all your content distribution all your content really and all your content strategy and its distribution um on uh, the kindness of facebook's algorithm um and also continuing to get really big numbers um, I think they're banking on in the future either doing sponsored content because they already have the audience um, or uh, Facebook saying we'll revenue share with you um, against all these all, against all these eyeballs that you're drawing. Interestingly enough, Snapchat actually came out a couple of days ago. I think it was on yeah, it was on Tuesday, um, and they said we want to move into a different model with people who create content for our Snapchat Discover. They want to go to the old TV model. They want to say, we'll pay you a specific amount um, to license your content, um, to buy your content for Snapchat Discover, and then we will keep all ad revenue. And that's, I suspect, because Snapchat is seeing such massive growth in terms of the eyeballs that it's drawing. Um, and they're like, how do we keep this money? How do we not share it with these with these content um, producers? And the simple way is to, you know, is to just license the content from them. Um, and then keep keep the ad buy. What are some other questions we have here? What are the advertising models of using social media for news agencies? Right, that's interesting. Um, so for us, for for BuzzFeed, we have a few different models um, at work. But uh, our most popular one, obviously, I think, is a sponsored post. So like we have a team. Um, I don't work with that team. No one in editorial works in that team. We kind of keep that very separate. Um, but uh, we have a team of people who work on sales, on the sales side of things. Um, and what they do is they create content that sort of looks like BuzzFeed content. Um, and and we, when we produce that and we share it on our social media channels, uh, it's always very clearly marked that it's an ad. Um, on our website, it says this is published by a brand so that there's never any confusion. Um, but the point is, if people are not interested in like clicking a straightforward ad, they, they've never had them. No one has ever wanted that. Um, uh, the attraction for them to come work with us is that we know the kinds of content that will get people to interact with the content, even though it might be an ad. So a good example of this is like, um, I did a little quiz on BuzzFeed, uh, I think like maybe a week ago, um, and it was actually a visa ad, and I knew it was a visa ad, but I wanted to do it anyway. And I think the quiz was something like, can we guess the last thing that you bought online? And to me, I was like, well, I'm interested, you know? I'm real curious if you can actually guess the last thing I bought online. Um, and I think at the end of it, it was like, you know, it was a belt. And I was like, no, it wasn't. It was shoes. And then they were like, okay, well, you know, get a visa. Um, you know, I, I, that's not that's not an especially old uh, form of, of like of, I guess financial success and model like advertising model, um, but it's working. It's working for us because brands keep coming to us and being like, "Hey, we're we're interested in this content that sort of looks like your fun content, but is a little bit different." Um, how can journalists encourage shares of their stories rather than individual clicks? Right. Um, you know, that's this. Here's the thing about it. Here's the truth about the share is that if you make something that you would share, then that's the key to it. But you have to find the share. And something that we talk about all the, all the time in our newsroom is like, if we we're gonna do a story um, and we're not sure whether there's value in the story, we kind of like ask ourselves the basic questions of would you share that? Um, because I think a lot of times newsrooms and um, journalists sort of get stuck in a place where they go, okay, I, really, I think the story is really important. Um, and I don't think that's the same as shareable, you know? Um, I think there's a there's a world where we make content and we we do it because it's really important and we do journalism because it's really important, um, knowing full well that it's not gonna share especially well. Um, but for us, like, it, the very basic is make it emotional, um, make it something that's relatable, and, and for BuzzFeed news particularly, um, we really strive for making news the most understandable it could possibly be. So, you know, those core principles um, at play will make something much easier to be shared. But at the end of the day, you can't, you know, you can't make something, can't make something shareable. People are not interested in like, if you can find the share and then put that in the headline, um, it will do better. So people are not interested in like, I don't know, the details of, 
of the debt ceiling, for example. Like that's like not a fun story. I remember when that story was happening, but they might be interested in what it might mean for them. And so if you're pushing that story, you're trying to sell an emotional story, right? So like the story is not necessarily what's going to happen if like the U.S. reaches its debt ceiling. Um, the story is um, how does how does the average consumer entirely removed from the bureaucracy of politics um, get impacted by that? So you might, you know, phrase a headline. I don't know how you phrase that particular headline, but you'd have to find um, some sort of human relatable way to do it. And that's why like the BuzzFeed News headlines are so simple, you know, so like clear to understand because like, you know exactly your relationship to it. Um, so people might, like today, for example, I saw a lot of headlines talking about um, people getting arrested for the for the uh, for the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, getting removed from from the site, and so for us, we did a really quick video, and the frame was just like a very simple question, which is like, this is why people are protesting um, the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, I see a lot of news organizations really hesitant to be as simple as possible, as straightforward as possible. Um, I think we get stuck in the cycle of new speak and what that means. Um, and oftentimes that's not especially good for, for shareability and we, we, we take that very seriously. What do we got over here? Um, is there any way to upload audio to Facebook and make it become native there? You know, um, none that I've seen so far. The most creative uses of video that I've seen um, are people creating um, like fun graphics that go along with the audio, you know, so like if the audio is rising, you know, like these bars are rising or they're, they're, they're dropping off. Um, but I guess that's sort of making audio visual, which is like not really the point of audio. Um, I, I'm curious if that will continue, to be honest with you, um, because podcasts are having a huge moment at the time. And I'm really curious whether um, Facebook will respond to this by giving you an ability to create um, audio natively on, on Facebook. Um, with that said, here's a really interesting or depressing statistic. Um, most videos that you see on Facebook don't, people are not listening to the, people are not listening to the audio. People will keep the audio off about, I would say most of the time, like 89% of the time. So like if you see a video, um, we upload videos all the time, like that have, that are text um, on video. And if the text is like clear enough to, to see, like sometimes we'll bother putting on music and making like a big production. Um, people turn on their audio 11% of the time, right? So like 10, 15% of the time they're turning on, they're actually like listening to the music that was in, in it. Um, if so if you want people to watch your video all the way to the end, we're finding that like if you put captions, it will have much higher um, finish rates um, because people are just not, you know, like the, the culture of, of this particular moment is not especially interested in audio um, and that like on Facebook. Um, and that I think is like a significant cultural change and I don't know how we'll cope with it, but it's interesting. What do we got over here? How many platforms does BuzzFeed use do you use as tools to help keep track of or manage, sorry, do you use as tools to help keep track of or manage the different accounts. Right. Um, I, as far as I can tell, like we're on all the major established platforms. So like we're on Vine, we're on Instagram, we're on Snapchat, we're on Tumblr, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. Um, we have dedicated teams. We have a, a very special team of like four people and their entire job is to be on the lookout of new platforms and like come up with early strategy documents to be like, well, if we're going to think of going into this space, this is how we might consider using it. Um, so, you know, uh, messaging apps are sort of on the rise, so like they're really having a moment and we don't really know where everyone's going to go with messaging apps. Um, so I think recently, like the Guardian decided to go with, they're going to do a messaging app bot that you could become a friend with, and then they will like, that bot will answer questions for you. Um, Quartz did a similar thing. Um, I don't know what we're doing with messaging apps, but they, like, they're dedicated to, you know, working on that particular strategy. In terms of tools, there are so many tools to help you manage um, your, your social networks. One we use a lot is something called CrowdTangle. Um, and CrowdTangle is mostly for, it's, it's a social listening tool. So it's essentially it's a tool for, for monitoring as many influential accounts as possible, 
And that's actually like a lot of our news teams use CrowdTangle to like see stories that you otherwise might not notice yet, you know? So like CrowdTangle picks up on Facebook posts that are getting a lot of shares or, you know, tweets that are getting a lot of reshares. Um, and so um, CrowdTangle is really good for, especially for finding stories. That's a lot of fun for us. What demographics are you referring to generally? In other words, who specifically is using and being targeted by BuzzFeed, Facebook, et cetera? Right. Um, the problem with, with answering that is that increasingly the answer is, is everyone. Um, uh, obviously, like we're talking mostly younger. So like BuzzFeed is very good, I think, at getting um, like the like 35 and younger audience. Um, but we have a lot of different um, teams. We have a couple of teams dedicated to figuring out what different um, age groups are, might be interested in and why they might come to BuzzFeed. Um, we also have a lot of groups. That's a thing that BuzzFeed does a lot. Like a lot of just like little breakout research groups that goes like, hey, what's like this group interested in? And they just kind of break off and then come back in a couple of weeks and be like, well, this is what we found. Um, just to add to that more of the, the knowledge base. Um, but generally speaking, I think people who, who people who live on the internet, um, people, um, I uh, hope you guys can still hear me. I don't know what's happening to my camera. Um, yeah. Great, I'm back. Um, right, so I would say, yes, it's totally, it totally tends young, but increasingly Facebook is sort of a home for a lot of people, like a lot of the internet using public. Um, and there was a really interesting stat, an interesting research study that was done, like not too long ago, uh, where I think teens, I wanna say in like Malaysia, not 100% sure, um, maybe between the ages of like 14 and 20, um, were, 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 were asked a few set of questions. And then what came out of the study was that they believe that Facebook is the internet, right? So like, I'm not sure if that, is, that translates to like everywhere. Um, I don't, it obviously doesn't, but I can't, I can imagine that there's a future not too long from now where there are more and more people who everything they do will be on Facebook. Um, they don't, they never need to leave Facebook. And why would they? Why do they need to leave Facebook if all their news is there, all their friends are there? Um, there was a really great piece by Ben Herman of the All, John Herman of the All, and he wrote this great, wonderful piece about how the next internet um, will probably wonder a lot what the purpose was of websites, like were they, and then he phrased it as, maybe we'll think of websites as really slow apps with no one in them. Um, and I really like that phrasing because, because I think we'll look back at what websites were and be like, well, that's not where the conversation was. Why were we, what were, why were we on websites? How is BuzzFeed's social strategy different from TVOs? Um, BuzzFeed, I think, um, takes social as sort of like, it's like a social first strategy. So like, as opposed to building stuff on the website and then making, you know, taking a really, taking great care to make sure that people come to that website, um, BuzzFeed starts at the other end. So it goes, where are people and how do we serve them the content where they are? Uh, so we, we, I think we begin with um, how are people consuming content and then we go, well, let's not, you know, let's not assume that we can change their behavior, um, but let's work with that and figure out how we can engage them on those platforms. So I think that's been the biggest difference is just encouraging people who live on the platform, period. It's been great. How should freelance journalists be adjusting their own social media posting habits to this new reality? Um, you know, I think to put it really simply, be sound like a person, you know? I think a lot of people try to sound, I, this, this sounds vague and we explain it, um, but a lot of organizations and a lot of journalists try to sound a little bit robotic, you know? Try to, in the, in the interest of pursuing what they view as some sort of like pleasant neutrality, um, try to sound a little bit too clean. Um, and, and Twitter kind of demands that you have an interesting voice. Um, and Facebook kind of demands that you have that there's some kind of draw. Um, for what you're offering and and I think a lot of that comes with voice so like honing a specific voice you know figuring out what you might sound like um, so is, is a really important step so for me like figuring out the voice for BuzzFeed Canada was, was a little bit of a challenge and I sort of what I settled on eventually is like I think BuzzFeed Canada um, it, <laughs> It sounds silly, but like I think we sound a little bit like a really smart, really intelligent, really engaged 16-year-old girl. Like I think that's roughly where we landed on, which means like 
a lot of a lot of memes and a lot of jokes, but also like the serious stuff. And I think uh, that voice like really worked for us. If you're a freelance journalist, you're trying to you're trying to hone your own voice um, as much in the work that you do as well as your presence. Um, don't try to don't try to censor parts of yourself, you know, um, because when you do that, you you unwittingly sort of hide away the parts that are really interesting that make people drawn to you. Um, so that's something to think about, I think. What are the implications of society if journalism stops presenting details and only delivers short, simple videos? Yeah, that's a good, you absolutely, you're right. That's a great question. Um, I think there's, there's a world where we're, where ideally um, journalists would get better and better at presenting information in short, simple videos. Um, the New York Times is so good at this. They've really nailed it down to the point where you watch a two and a half minute video on the New York Times um, and you test this through looking through their Facebook page um, and you can tell that they sat down with a story and then try to figure it out. And they go, you know, what is the real thesis of this video? And why do we need, you know, to use to, to, to lead up to it with 12 different sentences, why isn't that the first thing that people see? Um, I think overall, there are lots of news organizations that um, that are adjusting to the strategy and trying to figure out how to do journalism that helps them sleep at night while also adjusting to these strategies. I don't think that's like a, I don't think that's a simple um, process. And I think it will take a little bit of time. Um, but uh, I, I think as with all things, um, some some organizations will, begin to compromise uh, quality in favor of success. Um, but that's, that's not a new thing. That's been, that's been since the beginning of journalism. Um, and, and, and we see that all the time in terms of, you know, well, you, we will not name newspapers here, but like, you know, the newspapers um, who have been like, well, these stories will do a little better. Or the TV stations are like, if we lead with this, yeah, sure, we're compromising like a true, you know, sense of quality, um, but like we'll be very successful today. Um, I think the same thing will shake out on the web. And what's nice about it is that I think organizations that do good work um, are still around. Maybe they'll only see 30,000, 40,000 people who watch their videos as opposed to 800,000 or 2 million. Um, but they'll have to they'll have to live with that. They'll have to live with the reality that they can only draw small audiences to the type of journalism that they're doing and and they'll be okay with that. I think they will actually be okay with that. So my take on the longer form sites like Medium and the All, are they sort of anti BuzzFeed? I don't think so. Um, what, funny enough, like, so, okay, so let me just talk a little bit about a very funny quote that I heard our founder, Jonah Peretti, say earlier this year. Um, I don't remember who was interviewing him, but someone asked him what the biggest philanthropic operation that BuzzFeed operates at the moment. And he offhand, it was a good joke, um, said uh, BuzzFeed News. It's funny because BuzzFeed News doesn't, you know, excuse me, doesn't drive like the largest amount of traffic um, to BuzzFeed, but we believe that it's important to have good reporters do good work. Um, we have Pulitzer winners in our, in our midst. Um, we have people who do, you know, these amazing long form uh, pieces and they work really, really hard on them, um, knowing full well that they'll never get the types of views that the dress does. Um, so those websites like like Medium and The All, um, I think they do great work and I think they have their audience. Um, but we also, I think, have a dedicated audience that comes to BuzzFeed uh, specifically looking for like the long form stuff and the investigative stuff and the really thoughtful stuff and they find it there. Um, and I think that stuff can coexist on the web. I think the only thing is that ooh, people used to buy a whole newspaper and they might not read the A section, but they might directly go to the sports section or the health section or the car section. Um, and, but, like, but, but, the, but the news side benefited. Um, and now if you're just a news operation, if you're just an investigative operation, you're just a long form operation, um, you're going to have to be okay with fewer people buying that paper, right? You're going to be, you're going to have to be okay with fewer people, um, engaging with that content and, and that's okay. Your measurement of success will change. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think, you know, I don't think you have to go viral with a, with a 6,000 word investigative essay on, 
you know, this small thing that very few people will care about, but it's so deeply, you know, culturally important. I assume you need permission to use a property that matter. Um, the bugs punny pose. Right. Um, so the question is about intellectual property. Um, can't just grab images and repurpose them on my Facebook page in a similar manner, or can I? So that's a really interesting question because I'm, what's interesting about that is that in this particular moment, the dust hasn't really settled um, on how that will play out. Because, for example, GIFs are allowed for TV shows. Um, because if you're if you're using like a funny GIF from I don't know Pretty Little Liars or like a, I don't know Thirty Rock, you know, great show. This is like this perfect GIF that expresses how you feel that particular day. Um, a lot of people are using GIFs for TV shows, and like, is that is that you know improper use, um, or is that an adver an advertisement for that particular TV show? Um, the dust hasn't settled on that. So like. We're not seeing a lot of lawsuits on this. Where we are seeing some trouble, and I don't mean BuzzFeed, I just mean the internet in general, um, is in like photography. So photography is a really big area where people are just co-opting images um, and then using them in their posts, and that's clearly not legal and doesn't, you know, doesn't serve the photographer any better if you don't, you know, if you don't credit them. Um, and so I think in the next couple of years that dust will settle and we'll kind of have a way to approach it, but my suspicion is that if you're a large organization like Warner Brothers, um, you're not as interested in policing the use of your, um, you're not as interested in policing the use of your content in these like little ways if it raises their profile. Um, but that said, you know, this, this, this stuff literally changes day by day. Any other questions? But one final question in the queue, if somebody's got it. Everybody's silent. <laughs> should we Facebook Live yes. our next panel? Absolutely. You totally should Facebook Live your next panel. Um, uh, I mean, listen, Facebook Live makes it so easy uh, to be successful because it alerts everybody who follows your page that you're live at that particular moment. Um, I think like among the Facebook Live best practices is like you let people that you're doing a broadcast you let them know usually twice, like you let them know maybe the day before and be like, hey, tomorrow at 4 p.m. we're doing this Facebook Live and people are like, got it. And then uh, maybe you remind them a couple of hours before that and be like, we're, you know, at, at five, we're really gonna do this Facebook Live, it's gonna be great. Um, and um, so that's, that's, that's really helpful for, to make Facebook Live go bigger, but like it's a thing that takes off on its own generally because it's so social. So like the minute that a page is live, it alerts everybody who follows that page to go like, hey, you should, you know, you, this page that you follow is doing a live discussion right now. Um, and then, you know, you share it to your other pages. If you have other pages, you post a link to it. Um, there's an ideal length, an ideal length of a Facebook Live, um, which is longer than 45 minutes. You have to give, you have to allow people some time to kind of find the feed and then clue into it. So if you start broadcasting live and there's only five people, you know, don't get discouraged, wait it out, wait out a few minutes. Um, I think somewhere between 45 and 90 minutes is what Facebook really encourages um, for a live broadcast. So totally, totally Facebook live in this panel discussion. It's so easy. Disappeared through my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was uh, fantastic. Can people hear me now? Are you here? Is anybody hearing me? I don't hear myself, but that's okay. It looks like people are hearing me out there. And uh, really fantastic stuff, Ilamin. Thank you very much for doing that. And uh, if people want to go back, know. that's okay. If if people wanted to to go back and and check this out again, we have recorded it and we'll get it into our um, our website for CMG freelance uh, members. We'll get it up on there, uh, hopefully sometime next week. And uh, for you CWA Canada associate members, um, we'll get that out to you in your regular newsletter. And for Steve Threndel, you owe me $150. Ha ha ha. How do you like that, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks again. 
I, I did want to point out some some very interesting news that that just came through. Thank you, guys. Uh, that, I really appreciate that, that, that Rachel Sanders put up on our storyboard today. And if you haven't been on storyboard, you have to go there. Um, oops. Except Siri just tried to come on. Uh, this just happened. New York City Freelance Isn't Free Act passes. In a landmark victory, New York City Council has voted to protect freelancers against client non-payment. The Freelance Isn't Free bill, spearheaded by the Freelancers Union, passed today after a year-long campaign. Clients for freelance work. It allows freelancers to file complaints with the Department of Labor Standards against non-clients non and levies fines against clients who are found guilty of non-payment. Wow, that is certainly major, and I'd love to get that going here in Canada, starting with perhaps the City of Toronto. Stay tuned, more on that later. Once again, thanks to Elliman uh, um, and, uh, from BuzzFeed Canada, and we'll see you next time with our next webinar. Bye for now.